And then when I blew the whole thing up, um, you know, some of those songs hit, which was interesting to have like me be quitting music at the same time that like MTV was like playing the hell out of my video. Um, (laughs) My name is Adam and this podcast is about you and your journey in music and how you got to where you are now. Cool. Awesome. First off, yeah, nice to meet you. Where were you born and raised? Born in Lubbock, Texas and raised kind of all throughout the Midwest, York, Nebraska, primarily, which is south of Lincoln, very small town, 5,000 people, and spent a little bit of time in Midland, Michigan, just like every small town in states that I don't really visit anymore, landed in uh, the sort of a suburb of Kansas City, and then found my way out to Portland, Oregon as a teenager after that. Okay. So did you spend, uh, what, your high school years in... uh... Where'd you say? I'm sorry. I just- yeah, Olathe, Kansas. Yeah, I Kansas. Went, yeah, I went to high school with the Get Up Kids. And did other, you really? Yeah, some other folks that are actually, it was like a weird musical high school in Olathe, Kansas. Um, and then I, I came to Portland. Uh, my junior, I would have been junior year. I was, I was already in art school doing college stuff just because high school was such a nightmare. But I would have been <laughs> that age, yeah, like 17. Wow. Okay. How did you get into music? Uh, I got into the rave scene in Kansas City, like really deep where I, I like discovered warehouses after dark and, you know, it was the, the mid late 90s. Uh, and it was a scene, you know, it was the first time I had really felt like myself or found music in a way that like moved me or, or something like I had been raised in this sort of church environment and, mm-hmm. and really had only been exposed to acapella music and, and contemporary Christian music and so to like find this other entire world that actually no adults understood and so I was able to like kind of engage was pretty special at the time and I you know that sort of turned into me wanting to be a DJ and then that sort of morphed into me writing songs. I think, you know, I mentioned the Get Up Kids. I used to go to their shows all the time. We were friends. And so I, as they were starting to, to sort of become a thing, uh, also still in high school, we would hang out. I would, I sort of watch them do their thing. And I think somewhere in there, like, you know, I had always listened to Tori Amos and some of those sort of um, 90s, particularly female songwriters like the Innocence Mission, Liz Fair, um, and something morphed. Like when I was late, I don't know if it was drugs or what, but I was like in the rave scene and sort of started writing songs that were more singer songwriter than mm-hmm. certainly anything in electronic music at that time. Were you playing an instrument? Oh no. Okay. Yeah, no, I was, it, I think that was also the appeal of electronica or of like synth was that I didn't really have to have much talent as far as like playing things. Like I was able to like establish a beat and then do the part that I'm good at, which is I think songwriting and, and vocals and writing lyrics. Like that was always the thing that I was most passionate about. Um, and I think that I have talent around the, the, the times where I have played instruments in my music, it's been out of necessity okay. and not because I'm a particular um, genius on that instrument. Okay. Uh, you talked about doing these raves and starting to DJ, like, was that some part of your life? I mean, it sounds like coming from a Christian household, you were probably restricted to a lot of music and different things. Like, was yeah. it like, was that kind of like an escape? Like, how did you finagle getting out to the, to the raves? Yeah. A lot, you know, I had friends where I would go to like sleepovers and then we would go out on the town. I, I had, um, you know, it was pretty rough. Like I had had kind of a rough teenage year. It was hard for me to come out in that environment. It did not go well. I had been kicked out of the house and kind of came back. It was like a nightmare. Mm-hmm. And so I think there was a level of like, don't ask, don't tell kind of happening at that okay. time, mm-hmm. which allowed for the 90s rave scene to really um, open up to me. But it was the first time I had experienced joy, I think, around music or like it was certainly the first time I had experienced freedom as like a gay man to like dance and be happy and be openly myself and have that be like celebrated. Like that was brand spanking new in 1995. Mm-hmm. 
And were you, you said you were DJing some of these clubs too, or some of these parties? Well, no, I was trying to be a DJ. Like I got into like the idea of being a DJ and that eventually did like land me a couple of gigs, particularly when I got out to Portland, like I was like, again, sort of found the PDX rave scene and it was meshed pretty closely with like a scene at La Luna, which was a Portland um, indie music sort of bar and and venue where like Elliot Smith and all these the Danny Warhols like the sort of the people who you think of when you think of the Portland music scene back then they were all playing there and there was like an upstairs room where we were all taking ecstasy and dancing and the two groups mixed it, where like I one time landed at an Elliot Smith show, right? Like, and and I think that was how I met all those people and got really sort of got got my initial opportunities in this town. Mm -hmm. um, but that wouldn't have happened if I hadn't been at like La Luna Queer Night upstairs or like it was very, I think the rave scene, particularly as it started to sort of dwindle um, was the gateway into indie rock for me. Okay. What took you to Portland? Like, why did you decide to go to Portland? Yeah, I had visited. So my dad was really involved in Christian universities, Christian colleges. He was, mm -hmm. and he got a job as the president of one of those out here. Um, wow. And so I had come to visit with my friend who I used to have the sleepovers with. And uh -huh. she and I went out one night here in Portland while we were visiting just to like check it out and had like the absolute best time at this all ages club called the city nightclub mm -hmm. and it just felt like home like I was like right okay Portland um and I I stayed in Kansas City to like finish out the summer and then I came out here after that met my family out here and um went to PNCA which is like the art school here Obviously, mm -hmm. I, I'm a big like dropout person. Like I started a bunch of things and dropped out, particularly during that time, I think probably connected to the drugs I was doing as well. <laughs> um, but like, you know, that didn't last all that long, but I it, it was sort of the way I got here and had a reason for being here. And then I got really into the music scene um, pretty instantly. You know, my first record, I started writing when I was 16, 17, and then it came out when I was... 19. Okay. And is that around the same time you met Dandy Warhouse? Cause didn't you sign with them or you were working I did. with them? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. They, and a bunch of those bands like Dan Reed, I would count Elliot in that mix too. Like a lot of them thought it was funny that I was doing what I was doing. Like it was before the postal service had ever come out. Like it was like very weird when people saw me perform in those early days, there was a lot of head scratching but the okay. people who understood what I was trying to do were other musicians like like those bands I just named and so um you know I fell in pretty quickly with them they gave me an opportunity to record let me use their studio and that did eventually lead to the dandies sort of brokering um a deal with EMI Caroline Records on their own imprint for for me to have my first major label which also was an absolute disaster but it ended with them um, you know, helping me get all my music, my name, all of that back. So they've always been in my court, I think, from the time that I was a homeless drug addict to the time that I was like a funny raver. And through now, you know, they're still really supportive and we're all still friends. Okay. You said uh, you signed with the major and it didn't really work out for you. Is it just like, how did that all kind of happen if you don't yeah. mind talking about it? Yeah, no, I think like looking back, that all happened sort of in 2005 through 2010 was like that era with where, where like they were, Dandy Warhols were managing my career, uh, Caroline Records and EMI Records were trying to make me famous. Uh, I had a TV show on MTV's Logo Network that was right oh, when yeah, the I did Logo read that. came out and it was like all of a sudden my gay face was like in 26 million homes every week. Just like <laughs> talking so it was like a very strange time where like something cracked open and I, and I wiggled my way in but I wasn't totally ready you know I was I was like not major label material I was singing songs about addiction and abuse and the church and being gay and I was like a little too gay for that time like it was way before there was a Lil Nas X in sight it was way right. before all of the you know, acceptance of the last decade happened. And, mm -hmm. and so it was, 
in, in an environment where I was sort of cast to be the gay on the label. And, and it was very much like the idea of what these straight people thought gay was, right? So like they they had like bought me a sailor suit and they were like, you're going to wear a sailor suit on this pride tour. It was just like an absolute nightmare. <laughs> yeah. And it ended with me really kind of crashing and burning. Like we went on a tour and I had just gotten clean from like a 16 year addiction. Like, and I was still in bars every night. Like, it was just like bad. Um, and I had a really public meltdown, you know, I had like a thing where I, I had the dandies press list and I sent out a press release in the middle of the night, like saying I quit. And then I went and like worked at a LGBTQ community center for youth the next day and, and like was just done. Um, and the, you know, at that point, like they owned my name, not the dandies, but like Caroline EMI, like I couldn't yeah. actually be Logan Lynn, which it said on my driver's license. That's <laughs> so crazy. Yeah. The, the dandies really fought for all of that to end well for me. They got my, my name, my music, my likeness, all of that back and, and then gave it to me. Wow. Okay. And you've put out a lot of records, man. I mean, over the course of the years. I have, yeah. 1998 was like a long ass time ago, it turns <laughs> out. And I, I've just cons I've consistently put out music, you know, you know, every couple of years, every sometimes every four years. But uh -huh. like when you're talking about 24 years, I don't even know how long that is. How long ago was 1998? A while. Right, right, right. Like over two decades, it just adds up. Mm -hmm. Was it hard to kind of get yourself you know, pull yourself back up after the whole thing kind of fell out with the, with the major label? Like, did you want to quit me doing music at that point? I did. I, well, I thought I did. I think what I needed was a break and like some time to just be a human person in the world. Like I had never really had that where I was like connected to myself and, and able to like enjoy life as a sober person. And so I needed some, some time where nobody needed anything from me where I wasn't making anyone else money or needing to make anyone else money and failing like any of like whatever all that was like I just I couldn't do it man mm -hmm. um and it it was a lot of people trying to get me to be something that I'm not you know on every level whether that was like the wrong producer the wrong sound the weird ass sailor outfit all of it the wrong promoter like it was just wrong and I I really believe in sort of you have to burn it down in order to rebuild mm -hmm. and that was the great burn down it was humiliating in a lot of ways a lot of people thought i was crazy because i was um and also i'm really grateful that that happened like I, I was on a track towards i think probably death ultimately like it was very um I was an unhappy, unwell person and I had done all this stuff to get well. So stupid to still be unhappy and unwell. I'm, I'm really glad I did it. Could have done it better. Should have maybe not emailed in the middle of the night. Like there are lots <laughs> of things that like I did that were kooky, but I needed to somehow do a big broad stroke. And in that broad stroke, a lot of stuff sort of um, fell to the wayside. That was actually positive. And, and I have, you know, I realized in, I think pretty shortly after that, I didn't actually hate music. I hated that record label and my deal was bad and I hated everyone telling me how to be. Mm -hmm. Once you took that out of it, I was like, oh my God, songs, right? And I started you know, writing again, started releasing things on my own and, and it just has felt like mine ever since. Mm -hmm. You know, my career is sort of divided in half musically where like the first part I was like, on drugs and and unwell and unhappy and suicidal and singing about that. And the second half is like me having gotten well and kind of come back to myself. And so it's odd to be able to like, to sort of be forced to own all of that, like mm -hmm. to have this body of work that is just like forever, you know, like my deepest, darkest thoughts as a 17 year old mm -hmm. are downloadable. And not everybody has that, you know? Right, like, right. And so that's been interesting. I think I've, over the years, gotten way more comfortable with that. But I think I felt overexposed for a really long time. Like when I got well, I was like, oh my God, all of this work and video and how I was at shows and just how people experienced me in the world. Like 
I have to rescript all of that, you know, I have to sort of like give people a new experience of me. And I had to like learn how to be a person uh, in the world. And, and it worked, you know, I think the, the beautiful part of all that is like, I, I did some stuff that was like, probably not super planned out to push my to catapult myself in a direction that I knew would be better. And I, it turns out that I was right, it is better. And I'm, I sort of bounced forward in a way that um, landed me in a place that's just so much better than I thought it would be and it could be. And like, I found a, sort of a pathway towards success where I can really be my genuine self, mm -hmm. um, which is sustainable for me. Like I, that's sort of the only way I can do this. Was there a time, like, I mean, to write from a sober mindset, was that a lot different than, you know, you had success with what you were doing prior to that? I mean, was it hard to yeah. you know, look at yourself like, okay, now it's, I'm sober, I'm going to write this song and I'm going to have to put it out. And I'm sure that was a vulnerable time. Yeah, I think, I mean, people were into that I was like a coked out party boy, right? Like mm -hmm. that was the sort of thing that got me attention initially. Right. That's what got me my record deal. Like all of that was very much part of my brand. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think the writing style didn't actually change. And I just kind of kept doing the same thing, but, but I changed. And so the stories I told, the way I talked about addiction, the way I talked about myself, that, that definitely has changed over the years. And I think around that overexposure piece, like I write differently now. I, I keep myself safe in ways that I didn't before. I used to feel like I had to, like I owed it to the world. Some like who, whatever the world is, whoever is listening, I owed it to them to just absolutely open up my chest and, and show everything as it is without thinking through how I wanna present that, how I feel about it, like whether it's temporary, like all of that just became my forever truth every time I did it. And now I think as I'm writing, um, I'm still being really open, probably more open, but I'm smarter about how I, how I open up and like when and where, and I think, you know, I've, I've found a way of being um, honest in my songs in a way that doesn't hurt me again, if I'm talking about something hurtful, like I'm not in this, like, trying to re traumatize myself, myself, <laughs> you know, like, it's right, right. That, that was like the process for a really long time. And, um, and that's just not the not the vibe anymore. I like that. I like that. Um, what was the first uh, success that you had after you know, becoming clean and, and starting the music up again. Yeah. I mean, that all happened right like in the middle of it. So I had like the logo thing going on. I had the Dandy Warhols thing. I had just gotten signed to EMI. I was working on my record and I used my advance to put myself in rehab. And okay. I stayed in rehab for the better part of a year. Nobody really knew where I was, what was happening. I think a lot of people like assumed I was dead or like in a crack house. Um, but actually I kind of emerged well and, and changed that record. So I think that was the first time where like things hit in a way that, that felt genuine, where I could be proud of it. Like that 2009, when From Pillar to Post came out, that was the first time I felt like seen as myself as an artist, I think. And then when I blew the whole thing up, um, you know, some of those songs hit, which was interesting to have like, me be quitting music at the same time that like MTV was like playing the hell out of my video. Um, <laughs> yeah. That was an interesting sort of just a juxtaposition. I'm like, I'm trying to work at a community center. No, I can't do interviews. Like that was just a, it was like a weird time. Um, and then I covered that Miley Cyrus, We Can't Stop song in 2013. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, that was the first time I was like, oh man, like a million people have listened to this thing. Like that was the first that was the first time something non TV so, like kind of hit. Um, and it was also the first time I had done something that wasn't electronic. Like it had instruments. It was me with a band. Uh, and that sort of sent me down this path of like being open to exploring other uh, genres and, and working with a bunch of different people. And she took that song and took your version of it. Right. And used it she on did. SNL. Yeah. That wow. Was, what was that was a, like? It was a wild, 
that was wild on the today show as well like it was it was like performed our arrangement several times and then on tour that um bangers tour again as well it was cool it was very very good for me very unexpected like new york magazine wrote about it in a way where like it just sort of catapulted us to a new spot where you know more people i think heard my other music and um, wanted to work with me on on future stuff. I think I also during that time realized that like there's like an interesting opportunity around pop music that's like current um, to tap into and that that sometimes like people don't hear sadness in songs that are actually quite sad like that we can't stop song is like super sad to me when I mm-hmm. listen to the lyrics and so that's how my version sounded and, and I, I think I've done that several times where I've been able to like listen to a song an original and and hear something new in it and pull that out we've had I've had some success around covers oh, okay and when she hears it obviously that must have been crazy to know that she even heard the song, right? And then let alone cool. say like, oh, I want to do this version of it uh, at SNL and, and Today Show and all these things. Like, it was very was it like special. That? Yeah. Yeah. And it's cool to like see, you know, it was the, it was like a positive major label experience, right? Like to like have RCA records and all that just be very positive after my previous uh, major label disaster was, I think, healing in some ways. Mm-hmm. That's amazing. So that kind of, I'm sure, got your confidence back up and. Yeah, it didn't hurt. <laughs> yeah. It didn't hurt. Right. From there, what did you, what was the next uh, success you had? Yeah, so I wrote a record called Adieu, which was all about sort of my experience of mental health struggles over the years and getting well, just like that whole experience was like encapsulated in that sort of double album. And I won an award for that. I won the the, um, award of excellence from the National Council, which is like the sort of the top mental health people in the country, um, which was like special because um, Mm -hmm. it like had sort of a an advocacy layer attached to it from there on out, which I hadn't hadn't really designed it that way, but was very cool to have it be um, seen and appreciated in that way. That was, I think, the a, the, a time where I really felt like um, like what I had done sort of mattered beyond mm-hmm. like me sort of positioning myself as a cool guy or <laughs> I don't know, you know, <laughs> like the, every now and then I'm like everything we're doing is is kind of vapid. Um, uh-huh. and, and so anytime there can be like somebody got help from it or like it, it launched a online mental health campaign, like as a result of that, like all of that feels um, really useful, which I'm into. Is that when you got involved with Portugal the Man or is that later? It is. Yeah, that was right around the same time. I I had a concert series here in Oregon that was mm-hmm. all about mental health. It was like bands would come into town and I they'd play a few songs. I'd interview them about self-care, how they take care of themselves on the road. And I did that with Portugal the Man as part of that series right before Woodstock came out. Like Feel It Still had just started playing on the radio, but they had not done their intergalactic the record, yeah. thing just yet. Okay. Um, and they then went and did that. So like that, that record came out and they, you know, circled the globe and on their way back into the States, they partnered with me to like activate their tour around mental health. Um, wow. and so I joined them at every show in Oregon and like got on stage before they performed and just like talked to the crowd about suicide awareness mental and behavioral health care there was like a pledge we got them to sign it was like very cool and also spectacularly weird for a Mm -hmm. band of that sort of magnitude to decide to put a focus like that on something that at the time was like definitely not a focal point yet sure so they're I think of them as like real pioneers in the mental health space and then that just like I was on tour with them and I saw like how much they were doing like with communities of indigenous peoples with youth like every stop felt like they were building a community center at the show and like connecting people to resources it was just like rad um and so my wheels sort of started turning and I I met with them and their management just around like 
I think I can be useful here, you know, and, and we partnered officially right after that sort of designed their foundation, um, which I'm the director of now we launched in 2019 soft launch and then had our official big launch in March of 2020, which <laughs> ended up being kind of bad timing. Sure. But, but wow. launching, it was cool, I think, to, you know, in retrospect, to launch something during a time where they were going to not be able to tour. We didn't have any idea about what was going to happen with the world. Um, but like it ended up being sort of great in that we were all stuck. And the only thing we could really focus on was making sure this organization developed in the right way. Uh -huh. And I think, you know, now all that time we got to spend on it, it really, it really shows in the work. Yeah. And especially timing wise, as far as people needing probably an outlet like that. Yeah, for so sure. Isolated over the past, what, almost two years now. For sure. Yeah. We've been able to give away over a quarter of a million dollars just since launching to wow. communities that would have just otherwise probably not gotten funding. A lot of that looked like us like paying for shipping for PP. PPE masks to be sent to like Alaskan villages that would have otherwise not been able to get it because shipping is so expensive. Like it was, there are some things that are like really obvious that people need help. And we've written grants for like water crisis and things like that. But then there's other stuff that are like, like the thing I just described where people need like during the time of COVID-19 needed on the ground help and they needed it fast and they needed it in kind of unsexy ways right like it was like we need masks or we need you to pay for shipping and like for us to be able to do that during this time felt so great like i i think i would have otherwise felt like just completely powerless mm -hmm. um but those times where like the powerlessness sort of took over i was able to like actually help people by way of the band and i know they all feel really grateful to it as, or for it as as do i Wow. And with, with that, like, I mean, it sounds like this, this project launched in 2020, like you said, uh, did you have music lined up as well for that year? Like, what were you planning as far as uh, your music career goes? When yeah. That so, I mean, the, I launched the foundation. I also launched dot gay, which is like a domain um, oh, yeah. global fundraiser for LGBTQ communities, anti-hate, anti-trolling. So I was like really focused on projects and in the midst of that, I started writing also again, you know, I was like very much like um, trying to figure out where to put it all, which is sort of the thing always, right? Like, it's like, how do I get this out of here, out of my head, onto paper or onto something, into a, into a device that, that I'm, it's not just like knocking around up there. So I started writing sort of about like what I wish I was doing like not hearkening back to the old world, not trying to dream up the new world, but like just like thinking about what I wished I was doing during lockdown. Then it turned out like a lot of that, I just wanted to dance. I wanted to see my friends and family, like pretty basic stuff. But I think what emerged was a dance record. You know, like I started writing songs that were meant to sort of welcome us all back onto the dance floor and I didn't at the time understand or know what that would even look like like would there be dance floors is there going to be a world like all of us were in that space um, but I kept I kept writing and again you know I'm I think the music industry cracked open again during the pandemic and I was able to sort of find a way into um, an ideal scenario like with with kill rock stars and a few other things that happened during that time like it just I was ready and I I had work and, and I wasn't actually all that traumatized I mean I think I think LGBTQ people of a certain age have already survived a pandemic that took all of our elders and made us all afraid of each other and all of us who survived are absolutely traumatized by that experience and so you know a lot of this was familiar, like a lot of us have developed a skill set around this, which I think made it where um, queer and trans people thrived in a lot of ways during this time, because we weren't um, knocked down quite as far. We, we sort of have a, have, we understand what this is in a way that I don't think the, the broader population necessarily did. Mm -hmm. Even the unknown of a disease that's 
that's seemingly coming for you and everyone that you love, like that was a new experience for the vast majority of people. That was not a new experience for LGBTQ people who were alive in the nineties or before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that, that's a great point. That is a great point. Um, but the record's called new money. It is. Okay. And how much of this was written over the course of the pandemic or was it all written then? All of it. Yeah. Okay. All written during 2020. Um, and then recorded initially on my phone so like the really yeah I, all on voice notes on my phone the vocals all the vocal parts and then after we got signed after i got vaccinated right at the end i went back into this or back into the studio nothing i went into the studio for the first time for this record um and recorded actual vocals all in one day and Whoa, the whole record in one day Yes. So that's like when you hear the record, you're hearing my vocals from those sessions that day as well. And that's layered onto all of the vocals from my cell phone. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Wow. It's, a true, it's a true pandemic record. I love that. That's really cool. How did you get uh, linked up with Kill Rockstars? They saw, so Tegan and Sarah shared my, I, I released in 2020 for my birthday. I just like released one song, had no plan, but was like, I need to put out gay joy. Like it has to happen. So I did that and a bunch of people shared it, shared the video. Tegan and Sarah being one of the larger sort of names that did that and Kill Rockstar saw that. And then uh -huh. Kill Rockstar shared it with the all caps, gay joy as resistance and then i reached out and we had a meeting and i sent them the record and we they signed me wow yeah that's huge. very special that is really cool and are you gonna tour the record what's the what's the plan for it yeah so we've uh, i'm playing a showcase at south by southwest in march we're putting the show together currently through sort of first the end of february and then i'm playing the show with man on man oh um, yeah i've interviewed them they're awesome cool. yeah they're yeah. super awesome so doing some ronnie stuff yeah them. he's he's so cool legend actually yeah, i mean from my youth. legit like yeah <laughs> you know, i don't use that word lightly like he is an actual legend um <laughs> so, and they did a remix so there's a bunch of bands that have done remixes that are not out yet okay man on man is one of those there's some really exciting remixes that are coming out and we've had some exciting ones that are already out shoo shoo did one there's been several that are like um, um incredible that they're even that i'm like on their radar much less that they're like remixing um my songs but i'll play some shows that have yet to be announced after okay. south southwest but yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna tour if there's a world i'm assuming right. there's a world i've got my booster i'm just gonna keep doing the thing that Dr. Fauci tells me to do and hope for the best, but like sure. South by Southwest is happening as far as I know, and I'm going to be there. That's awesome. I know it's hopefully all I didn't see that there's the mass mandate has came back in California and everything. So hopefully yeah. it doesn't make any. I mean, it's still happening. Anything, but yeah, you know, we're sad. still in a pandemic. The thing that's wild to me is like when people talk about the pandemic as past tense. Yeah, it's like uh <laughs> i don't know where you live but it is right past tense where i am and no, i'm in one of the states where it's like been pretty great overall like oregon was like very serious about masks the whole time there you know we have had less of a problem than other states while still being a huge problem it's just it's interesting to me the length of time people have to sort of tolerate something Right. Um, it ends, it turns out it's very short. Yeah, right. Exactly. It's like, oh, this is over, right? Well, no, not really. <laughs> Forward of pandemic does not equal pandemic over. Correct. Exactly. Exactly. Well, Logan, thank you so much, man, for hanging out with me today. I appreciate it. Yeah, for sure. Thanks for having me. Yeah. I have one more quick question. I want to know if you have any advice for aspiring artists. Yeah, I think my advice for aspiring anybody is to listen to yourself and don't let external voices guide you. Like, especially early on in my career, the things I regret, the, actually the only things I regret about anything are the times where I let someone influence my art in a way that um, was just totally inappropriate for them to do. Like, you, I think hold tight to your vision from day one and, and that'll get you where you wanna go. Bring it back where you